Jeji Nanga. Let's start with the no karma. One of the five minor vows that we take as laymen is a form of celibacy. But we certainly don't devote one-fifth of our time to talking about it or thinking about it because it's uncomfortable to discuss. But in this class, we've never shied away from discussing uncomfortable truths. So today is the day we're going to talk about sex. The first rule is don't have sex with anyone other than your wife. What do you think it means when people say, the best way to say no to the woman at the bar is to say no to the bar? What do you think that means? I guess... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, me? Yes. Okay. I was going to say, like, uh, you know, I, I, I guess it just means... Come on in. That's exactly right. Thanks for coming. We're talking about sex. Of course, it means that the best way to resist temptation is to avoid scenarios where temptation might exist. We're talking about the saying, the best way to say no to the woman at the bar is to say no to the bar. And that means let's avoid scenarios where temptations might exist so we don't get ourselves in trouble. So that changes rule number one, which is Don't have sex with anyone other than your wife. The actual rule is don't put yourself in a position to have sex with anyone other than your wife. Now, for those of you who think that rule number one is easy, you're mistaken. Because it remember, it includes more than actions. Okay? We always talk about, right, um, the correct thoughts, the correct speech, and the correct actions, right? So this rule number one includes speech and thoughts as well. Now, can, after learning that, can you say that it's easy? I mean, it's almost unconscious when we see an attractive person, we have lustful thoughts about them. That we don't talk about it, we don't act on it, but we still have lustful thoughts about them. And so the best way not to put yourself in a position to have sex with someone other than your wife is to ha- not have lustful thoughts about others at all. Well, that's a different story, isn't it? It's not so easy to follow rule number one. So the second rule is to reduce and eliminate pornography from your life. So this is actually the first rule again, because the first rule... Hey, come on in. We're talking about sex. So this is actually the first rule again, uh, because it's about lustful thoughts about others. But it's common enough that we have to discuss it separately. The second rule is reduce and eliminate the pornography, uh, viewing of pornography in your life. So what's the problem with porn? Okay, there's lots of problems. The first problem is that it's not real. Okay, it's designed with the camera or the viewer in mind. And it's also designed to make you think it's real. And you could fall into that trap. And when the reality of sex hits you, you suffer a lot. You're in pain a lot. Okay? It's like thinking that superhero movies or romance novels are real. If you think they're real and that's how the world works, you're in for a lot of pain and a lot of suffering in your life. So that's the first problem with porn is that it's not real. The second problem is you can get addicted to it. Porn triggers an addiction cycle in your brain because it releases dopamine in your brain and you decide you you can get dopamine whenever you want, right? And so it changes your brain function and it's the same as all other addictions. It can take over your life. It can cause 
it can cause you to drop your responsibilities in life because you get addicted to porn. The third problem with porn is that it can lead you to avoiding your wife. Okay, it can lead you to not talking about problems in the relationship. And that was gonna, it might be fine for like a week or a month, but in the long term, it's gonna blow up your relationship. If you stop talking and you stop addressing problems in your relationship. It becomes like kind of like a, a mask that you use. The fourth problem is, with porn is we talked about dopamine, is you end up chasing that first hit like a drug. People always talk about, oh, when you try a drug for the first time, it's great, it's amazing, okay? But then when you try it for the second time and the third time, you're always chasing that first high, right? And so you start doing more of it, or you start doing it more often. Um, that's the same thing that happens with any drug. Hey, come on in. We're talking about porn. So that's the, we're talking about the fourth problem with porn. Um, it's like any other drug, you start chasing that first high and you start viewing more and more porn that you thought was wrong. Like previous you would think that's wrong, that's going too far. You start viewing more and more hardcore porn or it starts increasing, things like that. Right, so that's the fourth problem with porn. You keep chasing it and then you keep escalating it, the type of porn that you watch. And the fifth and final problem of, with porn is that it's short term, right? It's uh, unsatisfying in the long term if you become a regular user, okay? It's satisfying in the short term, like all drugs, but it will mess up your life. Okay, so we're talking about the one of the five minor vows that we take. We're talking about um, celibacy. And the first rule is don't put yourself in a position to have sex with anyone other than your wife. And the second rule is reduce and eliminate, reduce with the goal of eliminating pornography from your life. Questions or comments on that? See, I told you it was uncomfortable to talk about, but we are going to talk about it. It's one fifth of the vows that you, you should take. So we should have spent a one fifth of our time talking about it. We're on class 81. This is the first time we're talking about it, right? All right. So what does the book say uh, that layman should do? Great. If you want something easy, the book says you follow 10, seven to 10 steps and you're done. The book says, Try not to indulge in lustful stories, conversations, or talks about the other gender. Okay, so correct speech, right? One should not look with the lustful eye or in the spirit of lust on a woman or a man's body, which are factors in arousing passions. Okay, so don't stare, right? Don't stare at really attractive people. One should not listen to the private conversation of a couple. See, he's embarrassed. He's leaving. <laughs> I have someone behind me and it's CPA, okay? <laughs> the third rule, uh, one should not listen to the private conversation of another couple, okay? So don't eavesdrop. One should not bring to mind the sensuous enjoyment one had in the past. So don't think about previous great experiences that you've had. And avoid taking foods that are exciting, intoxicating, or stimulating. Okay, don't take alcohol and drugs, right? Because they lead to these problems. Okay, so uh, if you like rules, uh, don't embellish your own body, all right? So don't uh, ornament your body with the result of, I don't know. Does anybody have any idea what this is? Don't embellish one's body. I guess dress up attractively. Don't dress up attractively? Okay. Yeah, it could be that because we're not trying to put our, not put ourselves in a position where we might have sex with somebody else in our wife, other than our wife, right? It also mean like tattoos and uh, piercing and stuff like that. What does that have to do with sex? I think it's uh, the beautification of the body. Right. Okay. Some people find it fantasizing and right. piercings all over their stuff or tattoos all over their yeah. That's why I yeah. always... Right, it, but I don't know what is that. I don't know what does it have to do with anything with the, the sex or 
Okay, here's something. Uh, one should view the opposite gender as a brother and sister. Should not get involved in, in matchmaking except for your own children. And should not talk or look at a person of the opposite gender with lust. Okay? So that's how we not put ourselves in the position to be tempted. All right, so here's how you screw up. If you have sensuous intimacy um, with another person that's not your wife. So clearly that's screwing up. Uh, if you keep a mistress or go to a prostitute, you screwed up. Okay, if you gossip about sensuous pleasure or make sensual or provocative gestures. Okay, don't do that. If you leave your own children and celebrate the marriage of others, you screwed up. I'm not sure what that means. That's Anybody have any? Leave your own children and celebrate the marriage of others. I guess if you're pulled into somebody else's marriage, right? So don't swing, okay? I think that's what that means. If you wear indecent dress and decorations and take intoxicating food, okay? So we talked about that. Okay, so book makes it very easy if you need, and I like that, right? If you want rules about how to live, some people like that, some people don't. But the book makes it very easy to follow these rules. So questions or comments on that? Um, I wanted to mention about matchmaking. Uh -huh. uh, that's universal, whether you consider it <laughs> Jainism or any other religion, languages. Right. That's yet another tough one. I mean, inherently you feel that, oh, this would, like, you know, our, you end up suggesting, recommending, whatever the case may be. But, uh, uh, I mean, honestly, even Jaina promotes it. They have those kind of events as well. Right. It does say, accept your children. So maybe it means um, matchmake because matchmake because remember we talked about last time. Well, um, inducing other people to lie or commit violence or any one of these transgressions brings bad karma to your soul. So maybe the prohibition on matchmaking means that well you're inducing other people to have sex not with their wife. So that's bad for your soul, too. Yeah, but that is tough, right? Okay, so let's talk about... Uh, I have advanced... If, if you feel like all that's easy, then I have advanced set of rules. Let's talk about that. Um, and these, I think, are the rules for very... When you advance on your spiritual path, you should get here. Or if you are a holy person, you practice these rules. We'll go over them quickly. Uh, don't stay near or in a place with a person of the opposite sex lives. Don't be alone with a person of the opposite sex. That's a great one. Instead of just the bar, it's just don't be alone with the woman. Uh, don't observe the body of a person of the opposite sex. That is, don't look at another person naked. I think that that's what that means. Uh, don't sit where a person of the opposite sex has been sitting until a certain amount of time has passed. Uh, don't listen to the conversations of other couples or live so that you share a wall with another couple so you're forced to eavesdrop on, you have no choice but to eavesdrop on their activities. Don't think about pleasures you've had in the past. We talked about that one. Don't consume intoxicating food or liquids. Don't eat tasty foods. Okay, just eat simple food in moderation. We've talked about that a bunch. And don't adorn or decorate your body. Wear simple clothes. Okay, so it might be that don't go all out with your clothing to attract a person of the opposite sex. Okay. So the book says we should think about this in three different ways. Social, absolute, and empirical. That is, from a social point of view, we're a householder. Uh, we have just the one partner only. Okay. From the absolute point of view, that is, when you do these things, you're staying true to the nature of your soul. Remember, you're your soul. You're not your body, and your body includes your brain. That is, once the right faith is achieved, one can experience the nature of the pure soul. When one has the right conduct, he's engrossed in the nature of your soul, and you still have your five senses, but you've separated the objects of your five senses. That is, you're still having five senses in mind, but you've separated yourself from the objects of those five senses. And that's important, right? That is, where do you dwell? Do you dwell in your body 
or do you dwell in your soul? If you dwell in your body, you want sex. You want relations with the opposite sex. You want to look good for everybody. You want to make yourself look good because you think of yourself as a body. But if you dwell in the soul, if you realize you're a soul, you don't want these. And that's why we, I've been, we've been hammering home, right? Do you believe you're a body or do you believe you're a soul? And that epiphany that I had with most of the people didn't raise their hand that they believed they were a soul. This is one of the things that automatically happens. That's a shortcut you can use. If you actually believe you're a soul, your life will change overnight. Questions or comments about that? I have a separate question or comment. Sure. So don't judge me now when I make this statement. This is a judge-free zone. <laughs> now how does this tie with non-attachment? So I'm not supposed to be attached to anything. Am I not, why am I not allowed to take a look at whatever it may indulge me in my views, right? So if... What? That means you're attached. If you no. want to take a look at attractive people of the opposite sex, it means you're attached. Doesn't mean you can't use it as an excuse. I'm disattached, so why shouldn't I be able to do that? If you want to do that, that means you're attached. It means you have not gotten rid of your attachment. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to clarify, uh, non-attachment is a separate one of the five minor vows that we all take, right? So the five vows are non-violence, non-lying, non-stealing, non-attachment, and celibacy, okay? So the question is, the, the question is, if I'm not attached, why shouldn't I be able to look at an attractive person? Because I'm disinterested. Well, you're not going to take any actions, and you're not going to take any speech, but you're going to have those thoughts, and those thoughts are attachment. And those thoughts, those attachments, are the reason you want to look at the person, an attractive person of the opposite sex. Okay, so... these And that's great, uh, because these all dovetail with one another. That is... Um, if we are adulterous, right, um, that goes against society, right, that causes violence. Let's say, you know, I have sex with another man's wife. Well, that's going to cause a big problem. That's going to cause violence. That's going to cause violence with words, perhaps violence with actions. That's going to cause uh, deceit. Remember, we're trying our four enemies are anger, ego, deceit, and greed. I'm going to be accessing many of those, if not all of them, if I commit adultery, right? And so this is kind of a, a, a downward spiral of what happens if you succumb to temptation. You start breaking all of your vows, you start letting all of your enemies win, and uh, it will be extremely unhelpful for you. And not only that, uh, you ostracize yourself from society, right? And we need, uh, we need each other to support us to advance along the spiritual path. And remember, uh, I am the only one challenging you to be better people. Everybody, th every, outside of these walls, everybody thinks you're amazing, okay? Because you live a great life, you pay your taxes, you take care of your kids, but I know you can do better, okay? I know you can eliminate pornography from your life. I know you can eliminate anger from your life. You can do it right now. Here's my reminder again, okay? If from the last time I said that you can eliminate anger from your life, you had been working on it, you would have been done by now. Okay? So you can eliminate pornography from your life. You can be better because I love you and I want to see you advance on the spiritual path. And nobody else is challenging you to be a better person. I guarantee you. Uh, because you're really great already. Okay? Okay. So... Rule number one is don't have sex with anyone other than your wife. But if you and your wife are not having sex, well then I would advise a couple of things, okay? First, start working out. Hey, come on in. We're talking about sex. So if you and your wife are not having sex, first start working out, okay? And next, eliminate covert contracts from your life. Now, what's a covert contract? Well, have you ever been in this scenario? You're at home, you're sitting on the couch. Your wife walks in. How was your day? Fine, how was your day? Fine. And then she notices that there are dishes in the sink. 
And she said, oh, you didn't do the dishes. And you say, was I supposed to do the dishes? I was just, you know, and she said, oh, well, you know, you're relaxing. And if it was me, I would have done the dishes before I started relaxing, right? And then, so your wife has set up a covert contract. That is, she made a deal with herself about you and didn't tell you part of the deal, right? She didn't tell you what the deal was at all. She said, oh, if it was me, I would have done, done the dishes and he should have done the dishes. And she didn't tell you about this at all. That's a covert contract. And men, we have covert contracts too. And all of our covert contracts are about sex, okay? Men, we think that with regards to women, like, oh, if, if I take her out on a date, then she owes me sex. If I spend X amount of dollars on her on a ring or, you know, clothes or jewelry, then she owes me sex, right? Well, that's a covert contract. You made a deal with her, involving her, with yourself, without telling her anything about it, right? And it's just not true. She doesn't owe you sex for any reason, no matter how much money you spent, no matter uh, if you took her out on dates or made her happy, uh, your wife or your girlfriend or anybody doesn't owe you sex for any reason. So don't do those things if they don't make you happy, okay? You're supposed to do those things because they make you happy. If they don't make you happy and your wife doesn't owe you sex for any reason for those things, don't do those things, okay? So eliminate covert contracts from your life. So can you tell me some covert contracts you have with, in your life? It doesn't have to be about sex. It can be about anything. Because they're, they're there all the time. Okay? We don't realize that we make deals with other people uh, without telling them about it. And they get mad at them when they break the contract. I mean, it's an affirmation, never had expectations, but at the same time, that also leads me to believe that now the conversations could be judgmental, which shouldn't be the case between the spouses, right? Right. A lot of times we have uh, covert contracts with people uh, at work, right? We don't talk about what they're expected to do. Well, it's your job to do it. No, it's not my job to do it. Well, I thought you were going to do it and I'm getting mad at you because I had a covert contract with you and then I, you broke it and I didn't tell you anything so, about it. So, do you mean covert contract means expectation kind of thing? Like, you know, without telling you are expecting the other person to do it? Right. Or it's almost like a quid pro quo. Exactly. So what's the difference? I mean, you expect, you do expect from people, right? I mean, you expect from your kids, you expect from your wife, you expect from, I mean, but the, it's always there, the expectations. Yeah, but the main problem is, this is very, uh, this is main problem is you expect without telling, like, you know, uh, I mean, with my kids, sometimes I tell them, oh, why you didn't do that? And my daughter tells me that, why you didn't tell me that if you are expecting <laughs> So I think they are pretty open. If you are expecting me, then why you didn't tell me? I mean, and, and in our Indian thinking is, this is expected, you know, from the kids or the parents. So right. like, this is what it is. And that's when the main problem starts actually, that when you are expecting without telling, like the example which you gave, which is a very common problem, even it happens that, when somebody is tired coming from work and sees that, oh, you didn't do that? So, no, this is how it is. So, right. exactly, yeah. That's why my parents always tell me, lesser you expect, happier you are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I learned one thing is, even though you expect, so uh, I give you the real example. My mom, she is very religious, done fasting and all, but she took me everywhere, but she didn't tell me anything. She didn't expect anything from me. So actually I didn't get into that much and now she's no more and I'm expecting, oh man, if she would have been there, now I would have got more involved. So if I won't tell my kids that this is how you should do it or this is how expected, then they would say, you never told me, you showed me everything, but you never told me. So I think we just need to do a proper communication and that's when we can expect. And and after communicating, if they don't do it, that's a different thing. But I, th I think communication and opening up is, is main thing in this yeah right so you're, you're saying communicating the expectation communicate it now now just imagine that if i bring my kids over here to the temple i just bring them over here 
right but i didn't teach them or i didn't or i don't tell them that this is how it's supposed to be done or this is you know what we do and all those things so telling them and having a open communication and tell them about everything what's supposed to be done that you know that would help them mm. and now definitely if i talk to my daughter <coughs> something and she gets mad at me then i would definitely tell her that okay this is not the way this is what expected or this is how it should be done and i think you were right that more than expectation if we tell them that this is how it should be done that would pass the message very correctly because otherwise they would say oh you are expecting you know i'm not expecting you expecting from you but this is how it's supposed to be done and this is how it is done nicely and and again if you relate with uh sometimes it happens that when they get mad we get that mad at them but we say if we let them get mad and then we tell them uh that hey you were upset that time what happened do you think so that was the right attitude and all and when they are calm they say no i not and then that builds up gradually and they will stop that happening so that's how a main communication and you tell them what is right and wrong at least don't leave that no he's going to follow what he wants to but if you don't tell him and at, at some age till at least 16 you can train them after that you don't even have a control so man is too late to communicate even communicate no that's that's too late once they get a phone in their hand that's it done uh, well that's not 16 anymore no that's not that's not <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying right and okay. that brings up an important point that is how should we talk about sex with our children so uh i tell you currently my daughter is now 12 uh-huh. she is in 7th grade correct right. and uh, this is 3 months ago when she was so me and my wife don't like phone i mean we keep phone only once in a like 3 hours we keep a check up time but my daughter was spending because there is a chat group and they discord and all those different different things they chat right and then we put the uh, saying that okay no you can only do and do and do do this and then as my wife has ipad and she can check all what she does on the ipad mm-hmm. because we have connected that way so then we saw that one boy indian boy have been ding 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 the whole time right and then my wife reaches something and all and she talked to some parents and they says in school they are open about it they talk about it but they just tell them about uh, you know the physical and what happens and all those things but you need to tell them that how it also mentally affects you if something right. goes wrong and there and that right. so i mean nothing might nothing but you have to actually we felt like it would be odd but we thought no it's uh, gradually we need to start talking a little bit about that hey what this communication is about where it's going to lend you what's your plan about also a little bit about sex that what's the right age you know kind of little bit communication mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you have to do like once they get into the high school right and how is it received by your daughter uh my daughter said we have been already taught about this in the school we have been told we know it is and i know what it is but if someone is messaging me i cannot control it because if i be rude to him then that get mess that pass right. and he had the peer pressure is also not right so she says we she is very much sure she says no we have to handle different way i cannot like a like you guys talk to me or indian type i cannot do that right so she says that no uh, i will handle it my own way the person is messaging but i'm not going to respond mm-hmm. so do not worry about it so she she took it positively and she so she said that uh, no i i understand all those things and i also understand what is our culture and all those things so we took it like culture way also mm-hmm. so she says no we i understand correctly that's great she took it right away. that's great um and that's uh one of the things that many many sources say is that it's not going the sex talk is not like a one hour talk and then you're done okay it's more yeah. like regular conversations it's more like 5 minute conversations over the course of 2 years okay that's the correct way to do it and it's the correct way to do it when uh when you see things come up together you know if you see uh somebody pregnant or if you see and at a really sexually suggestive ad on television that's the right time to talk about it right then or if you see a commercial for feminine hygiene products that's the right time to talk about it uh it should be bursts of 5 minute conversations 
and then you make it something comfortable to talk about in your family and then the kids won't be uncomfortable and you won't be uncomfortable and that will facilitate the communication so if and when there is a problem your kids feel comfortable in coming to you it should also be age appropriate so if a five-year-old asks you oh where do babies come from you can say well they come from a mother's body but if that person is 10 years old, you could say, well, the mother has a uterus and the baby comes out of her vagina. And so it should be age appropriate. Um, you should also uh, use the specific words, the specific type, uh, the <coughs> specific words of the anatomy. OK, um, so that way they have an understanding of what those words are. Uh, there's some more lists about what is the right time. Uh, let's see. When you see gender st stereotypes in ads, okay? Uh, when you see news stories that talk about sex. Um, so here's some conversations. Uh, you should uh, also, the thing is, is that you should ask them questions, okay? You should ask your kids questions instead of going into lecture mode, which is always fun for us. Uh, you should ask your kids questions about what they know. So what do you know about how pregnancy happens? Uh, what do you think about this celebrity being photoshopped in their Instagram? Uh, how do you feel about um, girls having pink toys and boys having blue toys? Okay. Uh, what would you do if you were this character on a TV show? So you should ask them what they know about it. And you might be surprised at their answers. You know, maybe they know the right thing to do and you can talk about other things. Um, so other ways to start the conversation with children about sex is to give them a book about the anatomy and, you know, let them explore and then talk about the book later. You know, just leave the book in their room on their pillow, say, and then they'll, they'll of course, go through it. Um, so one question on that. Yeah. Right. Like we learn all these things not by TV or by telling our parents. We learn with from our friends or naturally, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, like say my 10 year old girl, she knows about it, but if it's not needed and if I try to talk or if I try to like put the book and all, don't you think like right now, say even if her mind is not getting diverted towards those things, I'm actually involving her into those things, you know, I mean, I understand if needed, it's good to talk. But like it's like introducing something which not that person supposed to get into yet or he doesn't even have a thought about it would be appropriate to do right now. So it's a very fine line. OK, so there's too early and too late. You've correctly identified that and you think that it's too early and that may well be because kids are different. Yeah. Um, and so maybe it's too early. Like for my kids, it's too early. Um, but there you don't want to be too late either because then either you're dealing with problems or you're letting them be influenced you're getting you're letting them be influenced by misinformation okay so you're right there is a line and you want to be not too early and not too late uh, you don't want to introduce it before they're ready and you don't want to introduce it after they've already had wrong beliefs or you know they've known about wrong beliefs for years and that's why this conversation part is important because you want to know what they know about it and so uh, I wish I could give you a straight answer, but I cannot because it because changes. Because I, I give you one example. When I came to U.S., me and my wife had a shop. I mean, definitely everyone has it. That when we came here in 2007, uh, going to the swimming pool and seeing the woman in a swimsuit and man in a just a swimsuit right. was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, the, our kids, they see it from the childhood. It's not a big deal for them. Even like for us, nowadays the movies, even Hindi movies have a kissing scene very common, yeah. but not at that days. That right. days we would not even dare to watch. And now when we watch Hindi movies or any movies and they hold a hand and kiss my, my eight year old son, he covers his head and then we tell him, no, you see the age of what they are. So you are just seeing it, but ignore it for your age right now. So, 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 I mean, I feel like here the thinking is different and I think I think they are and here the kids at the seventh and eighth grade itself they start talking about all this thing. Right. Right. And so not only, not only that they, they see other friend circles, right? Who are starting to have relationships 
And if you have that communication with your child, your spouse, or your mother, your spouse, um, that would be appropriate time to discuss how they are uh, they are exposed. It depends on that what say, they are saying and where they are going and all those things. Right, and you should communicate that to your child when it's time, right? Like, I expect you not to have a boyfriend in high school, if that's what is right for you and your family. Or I expect you, uh, if you do, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. But I would like to meet them. I would like to talk with their parents, if that's what's right for you and your family. You should express those expectations to them uh, at the right time. So other rules for talking about sex with our children. Uh, don't jump to conclusions about why they're asking about things. They just ask things because they're curious, not because they're in a relationship right now and they need to know the answer, right? Uh, keep your answer short and simple. Um, keep the conversation open. Like use questions like, oh, what other stuff like that do you know about? Or what's going on in your life that you want to know about or that I can help you with? Um, uh, if you don't know something, admit that you don't know something and find the answer or look up the answer together. Uh, that's a good rule, not just for children and sex, that's a good rule about any questions coming from your children. Uh, they ask more questions than I could possibly know the answer to. Um, and don't be embarrassed or awkward. Uh, as time goes by, it will be less embarrassing or awkward. Or awkward. Okay. So this sex thing has a two effects, right? One is a physical and one is a mental. And mental is very, uh, like, more effective, isn't it? More, more effective in what way? Because they go through a lot of feelings. That's that's the uh, another thing, uh, except physical too. Yeah, we can't do anything about the physical aspects of puberty, right? There's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. The only thing we can do is help guide them through it mentally. Exactly. Right. So one challenge is this, this everything is online now. I think, I think that's, that's a bit of challenge is you don't know what to I mean, anything you go to Instagram or TikTok or it's, it's only about mostly about, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a negative uh, method of, you know, displaying people are just out there putting stuff. So right. It's, it's difficult to try to, you know, we talk to them, but we don't know what extent is going on online and stuff. You can put uh, restrictions and all that. It's still, it's still pretty tough. To that's that's certainly the case. And the, what we should do is we should prepare them for that, prepare them for those challenges. And it is possible. Um, I know that a lot of times it seems like the stuff we tell our kids do not get does not get through, but some of it does get through. And uh, it is possible to prepare our children for the challenges they will face online. And bringing it up when you see those things is a great way to do it. Uh, you're right, we can't control their activities online. We can certainly monitor it as you were saying and we can certainly talk about it. And But ultimately, remember, childhood, your whole life is a process of letting go, right? And that includes us, right? When you start in the womb, your first challenge is letting go of your mother feeding you directly through the umbilical cord, right? Your second challenge is letting go of feeling yourself as the same identity as everybody else when you realize at some point you're an individual, right? And of course, the letting go continues throughout our life. We let go of our parents. We have to let one, one part of that is that we have to let our children go at some point. And this is the process that's going to happen to us whether we like it or not. And for some, for some of us, it might be too early, but in order to prepare our children, we have to be able to let go of them and trust, let, allow them to fail in ways that won't hurt them for their whole life. <laughs> so, what so what the what side side is of letting go? Well, not necessarily of letting go, but uh, you know, letting kids fail that won't really you know, affect them for the rest of their life. So, uh, some people. Um, allow kids to have relationships while they're in high school and those relationships fail, right? If you don't, and then you guide them through a breakup and you guide them through that heartbreak and that won't affect them for the rest of their life because you're there to give them a safe landing spot. 
Um, if you if you have a, a rule where, well, listen, there's no relationships in high school, then your kid goes to college and gets his heart broken for the first time, that might mess him up for his whole life. Yes? No, I was saying that, uh, you know, for your question, I mean, uh, we have, uh, have words in our router that this kind of videos or search or anything kind of that, block it and send me a notification so at least I know that something was going on. So I have configured my router like that. So this is a way we can help each other. What are your questions about this kind of practical stuff about your kids, about having a conversation about sex, about, you know, making sure they get the right information. What are you worried about? What are the challenges that you are worried about? And then you can get help from some of us that have gone through this before. Well, I have a few comments. One, that, uh, you know, we, we think about virtual thing, which is definitely a, a concern. But nowadays, if we just think about the Hindi movies, you know, Hindi movies have no filter anymore. We talk about English movies, uh, the channels, the short things. So, to me, I mean, even the hoardings that, you know, uh, we see on the streets, uh, uh, the things we receive in the mail. So... I think it's all around us. I mean, virtual adds to it, but that something uh, requires, at least in my mind, us to be more closer to them. What we all discussed, the communication, conversations, it's not a one-time thing. It's, it's all us being close to them and the, the values being strong enough to protect them from this kind of things. Uh, the other thing I thought of... Uh, well, second is what we learned recently when we went on a, on a trip with some of the kids. That, you know, we have an age in mind, let's say 10, for example. You know, my daughter is 10. But my daughter has friends who is 10 have elder uh, siblings or high schoolers. So that what she learns from that 10-year-old. And, and, you know, so if you, you might miss out that age when you're about to talk and then, uh, you know, they, they already know more than what they need to as a 10 year old. Uh, so that's something I have to be in mind as well. And the third thing I, I think is what you mentioned about, you know, experimenting on high schoolers, right? I mean, allowing it's to me, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a double edged sword or a thin line if you want. I mean, it, it can go, it's like, you know, testing uh, uh, drugs or whatever it is in your high school so that you know and you know you can protect them and then they won't do it in future. Uh, it can go either way as well. So, in a way, it's, uh, like you said, it's a tough topic to talk about, but it's especially in this country, I mean, I'm not sure India is different anymore. India is not behind. We used to say this country uh, when you arrived in 2007, but I think it's yeah. probably no, same it's in India right it's now. Same whether it's worse. It, yeah, probably worse, right? I mean, uh, so all we see like movies like Metro and stuff like that, so, I think it's everywhere. I think we, we need to be uh, talking about it uh, and and be aware ourselves. I mean, especially, I didn't know the book says so many things about it mm -hmm. uh, straight away. And sometimes it's like, okay, it's common sense, but it's it's uh, it's one of those things that we have so many common sense, but hard to <laughs> implement. So, it's good good to know about it and, and actually uh, learn and, and apply it. And, and one more thing is, uh, I don't know, during Super Bowl, uh, there were ads for the gay and all those things. So that part, I don't know how to explain that, but, you know, they will definitely <laughs> it's part of the hear about now. it. So I am very sure when she goes to high school and all those things, yeah. Yeah. And they must have even known about it, but Middle school. they already know. Oh, okay. yes. My daughter said several times, um, and they have a friend that says, they one neighborhood Asian lady, who was born to a, I guess, a Christian Baptist church. She goes, she doesn't like coming to the school because of the stuff that happens here versus the other and, doesn't. And one part definitely, I mean, all of us, but you get scared, you don't know, I mean, where their mind goes by knowing all these things because it's so much to handle. That, right. Okay, you know, so <clears throat> we haven't never touched that topic yet, but that that's one of the things, scares saying that they don't know because at this age, they will learn something and they say, oh, this is common. I can go for anything. Then you know, don't know. So right. that, that's very uh, important thing, I feel. Well, certainly gay marriage is allowed in this country and um, it's part of the Constitution now. And so we're certainly going to see more and more of that 
um, uh, as we go along, as more people are comfortable coming out of the closet. And that's something we have to show up that our kids, it's fine if you're not gay, but be respectful of other people's uh, marriages and things like that. And that's a conversation that's one part of the larger conversation that we're having with our children. Questions or comments about anything that we talked about today? We talked, we went... No, I didn't find anything in the book about that. I think it'll, be, it'll be addressed in the next revision. <laughs> because it probably was not a, a concern back when the book was written. Right. What's the question? I'm sorry. The question was, what does Jainism say about uh, gay sexuality? Uh, I didn't find anything in our book about that. Questions or comments about anything we talked about today? We talked about a wide number of topics. We talked about the first rule. Uh, we talked about pornography. We talked about what you should and shouldn't do. Okay. We talked about, well, this could all be solved if you actually believed you were a soul rather than your body. Um, we talked about eliminating the covert contracts in your life regarding sex. And we talked about how we should broach the topic of sex with our children. Okay, so um, Bhavin wanted uh, whoever was going to uh, participate in the lunch program, he wanted, he couldn't be here today, but he wanted the menu to be planned tonight. After, he wanted us to meet and have the menu done today. So uh, we have a little bit of time, not too much. So if you guys want to do that after class, that's fine. Thank you everybody for coming this week. It's really important that we talk about uncomfortable truths. This class has never shied away from uncomfortable truths. And I think we got a lot about applied Jainism, how to take Jainism out of these four walls and into our life. Thank you for coming. Your time is not something that I take for granted. Uh, I really enjoy the hour that I get to spend with you each week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.